What's up, guys? Welcome to another edition of Before the Whistle presented by BRK Insurance Group. If your business is looking for the best in employee benefits, commercial property and casualty insurance, or retirement and 401k plan services, there's no one better suited to meet your challenges and build a plan centered around your needs than BRK Insurance Group. What's going on, y'all? Happy draft day, Friday, day two of the draft, I guess, when this is coming out. Draft day as I'm recording this episode. Happy Zurich Classic for those of you who are in New Orleans, Jazz Fest. A lot going on here uh, down in New Orleans. I was over at the Zurich Classic earlier, the golf tournament going on this weekend in New Orleans and hopped on the radio on the sports hangover on ESPN 100.3 with Gus Kattengale and Todd Graffinini, as Tulane fans are very familiar with, talking a little bit about the draft and just about all things sports. And it was really fun to get out there and, and just talk football and not necessarily think that much about it. Um, but I came back and I, I've really been trying to sit here and think how to really best break down the defense and the spring game and, and give the best insights here. Um, for those of you who caught my Tuesday episode, I primarily focused on the quarterback competition and took a little step back on just the responsibilities of covering a quarterback competition, being responsible for knowing your own biases, wanting to be fair, um, and just really understanding what a competition is and the fact that these are guys that are 22 years old and haven't been starters since high school. And so they're fighting for a dream in a different way than covering it at the NFL level. And so I really just wanted to pause and make sure that I did that justice and did my um, moral responsibilities, if you will, moving forward into fall camp, because as we know, that quarterback competition for Tulane is going to continue quite a bit. I didn't really get into the offense that much, but we've kind of seen over the last couple of scrimmages for Tulane that depth chart really shape out. And we've also seen a little bit of exodus, quite a bit of exodus in the transfer portal at that position, as well as some additions there. Uh, so I, I planned on going into this episode, breaking down the defense, and I'm going to do that really to the best of my ability, but there have been quite a few transfers at a couple of key position groups. I think it can show us a lot about where this team might be going during this offseason period, but I'll do as best as I can. And then on the eve of draft night, uh, if you guys caught, the NFL Network really did an incredible special uh, with Michael Pratt and his story and all of the tragedies that he's gone through. It really was another thing that made me take a pause and just think about what this job is to me, what covering these guys is like to me and how important telling their stories are really going into this draft and what you'll really be getting out of these two lane guys, but just really how important that leadership and making a difference. If even one kid hears what that story is and has a better life, makes life choices because of it, then Michael Pratt has already been, you know, a hero. And that's something that I really want to focus on on today's show. So I'm going to go a little bit all over the place. We have plenty of this offseason to get into a lot of position groups, and let's start now. It's easy to hear a promo in the middle of a podcast and think, of course they like the product, they're paid too. Well, if you know me at all, then you know two things. One, I'm truthful, almost to a fault. And two, if I were in it for the money, I'd certainly be doing something else. So believe me when I say that I love Blue Oak Barbecue. The food, the drinks, the people, the location, yes, all of that. Blue Oak Barbecue has a great selection of your favorites from the smoker, fantastic sides, and awesome bar specials each and every week. And we have something really exciting in the works coming out, uh, I believe, next month uh, there at Blue Oak from the drink category. But in the meantime, go check them out. Blue Oak Barbecue, located at 900 North Carrollton Avenue here in New Orleans, or visit them online at blueoakbarbecue.com. And back again to these April specials. Uh, Monday, you stick to your classic with your red beans and rice, you got a chicken mole on Tuesdays that looks really delicious just based on that picture. And then you keep it simple on Wednesday with the house smoked turkey sandwich with guacamole, arugula, and killer wheat bread. And that is definitely something that I am looking forward to trying over at Blue Oak for sure. So go get yourself some specials. And to start things off, let's talk transfer portal just because that's really what has kind of changed my trajectory of what I'm going to be covering here. Uh, it, you go into the spring game and we have kind of seen what happens when you start to see those team evaluations. Uh, we haven't necessarily seen uh, an exodus for Tulane at positions 
they have been positions of need, but it hasn't necessarily been those starter guys. But when you start to see so many guys leave a certain position group, it starts to make you wonder about what kind of the moves are, what they might be rotating in there. And it makes it only, you know, so easy to cover spring practice when you know that there is this portal period and you might be bringing in some guys. Uh, it's not the same as it is in that December portal period with those types of guys entering the portal. I, you know, some guys are red flags at that point of why have they entered the portal so many times. Uh, and and it, it's just really hard to know where to go and think that you'll be able to get the playbook down in time and everything going in, either, in order to get started. But just like the guys had happen at Tulane where you go through the spring camp and you have your evaluations with coaches and start to see where you end up on the depth chart that happens at every single other school. And so you're looking at those positions to hopefully be coming in the transfer portal. And so we've seen quite a few guys at Tulane leave quite a bit of wide receivers. I've been trying to keep track of this. We saw Therese trainer leave from Idaho, Jalen Griffin from UCF, uh, Hunter Summers, who was a freshman last year for Tulane and Jalen Rogers at the wide receiver position. Uh, they also lost Iverson Celestine at running back along the offensive line. They lost Noah Gardner and LeJuan Owens, um, as well as RJ Whitehead. I s skipped over him. Um, you know, those are guys that are at positions of need, at least on the offensive line. Uh, and so it is, a little, I guess, mystifying on the outside as to why these guys are entering the transfer portal. I don't know anything uh, in terms of who's Tulane is bringing in. I do know that they have made offers, uh, you know, per following these things along on Twitter. They have offered an interior offensive lineman from Georgia Tech, Gabriel Fortson. So we'll see if he ends up accepting that. And if so, you might be able to read the tea leaves there in terms of why those guys are all leaving that position. Uh, but tackle is a position of need for Tulane. And yeah, they did lose quite a bit of depth at that role, but they don't have a starter there either. And so it, it, which one is kind of more important? I think they're probably going for that starting position. Uh, the wide receivers that all ended up leaving, it was a really crowded room. It was almost too many cooks in the kitchen is where it started to get to at a certain point. And we'd heard John Summerall kind of describe, you know, the top couple of guys having that dynamic playmaking ability, but that the whole room, it's not just about that flash and that traits, but who's consistent, who's dependable, who's reliable. And those are guys like Bryce Bohannon, Fat Watts, Dante Fleming becoming a consistent receiver throughout spring camp. And so I think you're seeing those guys get those opportunities. And then you're seeing Kai Preen come in over from LSU. I haven't had time to delve into his tape quite yet, but say what you want about what the groups are of need on this team and how far they still have to go. But the amount of four-star talent that John Summerall has brought into this program, we'll see how it all plays out on the field, but we're just playing with a completely different set of chips than Tulane really has ever been a privy to. And that's really, I think, where the college football playoffs really comes in handy here. Um, the other things are of note, where you saw a little bit of that exodus on the defensive line, as well with some depth there, some guys at linebacker like Taylor Love. Again, these are no guys that were really any starters at any positions. Uh, it was the DBs that kind of caught my attention as the guys that were leaving in Jai Eugene entering the transfer portal. And then recently, as of an hour or so ago, uh, DK Magruder entering the transfer portal as well, a transfer that came over from Gulf Coast Community College. Uh, somewhat surprising. It's one of those things where I do wonder where the conversations went behind closed doors with these guys and who is potentially coming in. We know that Micah Robinson from Furman has accepted an offer, but the thing with transfers is there's no letter of intent. So until they show up on campus, it's really hard to say. Um, they also have offered Jonathan Edwards from Indiana State uh, at defensive back, as well as Treshawn Devonis. Devon, I'm sorry, I should have gotten these pronunciations done. Uh, defensive back from Rice. So we'll see who kind of ends up coming there. But we've heard John Summerall say, and it, it, the staff has been incredibly open with you know what their needs are, that they were looking for that experience at cornerback, and it was just too young of a position group. And yeah, you can coach guys up, and there are guys that have started as true freshmen before, but typically in a room that includes quite a bit of veterans that are able to give that experience throughout. And you just don't have that much at the cornerback role for Tulane. And you've seen at this point, you know, if you're asking why would someone like Jai Eugene enter the transfer portal? 
Well, you know, he started out with the ones and then Rishi Raton has been the defensive back of spring camp and worked his way up into the ones throughout the scrimmage and is probably looking to get a scholarship with the way that he's played. Um, and so that would, A, just be a great story, but it just goes to show that it, it still doesn't matter about pedigree. You can get excited about these guys that are coming in. But it's really about what they're doing on the field. So now you have Lou Tillery and Rishi Rattan at corner, and you don't really have any depth. So you're assuming that Micah Furman is coming in, and you're assuming that there's probably been some other offers out there. We have seen a couple of them. Yes, the guys have to accept the offers, um, but I think you're just seeing kind of the byproduct of those conversations of guys that might have thought they were higher up the depth chart than they might have been. Um, defensive end is one that I don't know if they've made any offers out there so far. It's one that they probably still need an edge rusher at. I think you can comfortably say at this point that they're really going to try you know, the developing of Michael Lunds and Matthew Fobbs White, Deshaun Batiste. They have a lot of young guys there that definitely have potential um, do you want them all starting across the line? I'm not entirely sure about that. You have Angela Anderson having a ton of experience at that end role. And then I'll be curious to see what they do with Patrick Jenkins. If he stays at that defensive role, at tackle role, if they have to end up moving him outside because of the way that things are going, you know, we saw AJ Thomas and Maxie Bowden, Bodon, I'm, I, I'm really sorry about not knowing how to pronounce that last name, uh, as the second teamers in the scrimmage before this last one. So those guys are both vacated, but we've seen Adonis Freelu. We've seen Parker Peterson. We know that Cam Hamilton is injured, but also comes in on that interior. And then you have Patrick Jenkins and Eric Hicks really anchoring that. And that's about as good as you're getting in terms of experience um, throughout all the position groups. Linebacker, I think Dixon Agu has really been just a quiet surprise of training camp. Not really a surprise, but I, I think the fact that linebacker hasn't been talked about that much really says a lot. When you think of the fact that going into last season, you lost Nick Dorian and you're wondering if Corey Platt and Jesus Machado can get it together. Corey Platt goes down after he's a leading tackler in week one. And so suddenly Tyler Grubbs is thrust into this role opposite Jesus Machado and Jesus Machado gets injured in the military bowl. And we don't know what his return trajectory timeline has been like. So it has been next man up there. And it has struck me that throughout all of the post-game uh, press conferences with John Summerall and everything that he's told us, not one time has linebacker really come up as a position of need. Maybe earlier on, but it goes to show, I think what Tyler Grubbs and Dixon Agu have been able to do as a unit. And then you have Chris Rogers that comes in from Troy, backing them up as well as Makai Williams. So that group has a decent amount of depth. And we're, what we're going to see happen at Tulane this year, which I'm really excited to dive into this offseason, looking at opponents and how Tulane can really scheme against them, is that they're going to be matching on defense based on the personnel on the offense. Uh, you know, in the NFL, you see it a lot more, where teams will substitute out guys depending on who the offense brings on the field. If an offense is in, you know, let's say 21 personnel, and you're out there in nickel, where they have two running backs and a tight end out there, but more likely than not going to be a run play. Um, either way, you want those big bodies out there uh, to be able to match them, block them on the line of scrimmage, take those things on. Whereas you probably want more of a nickel uh, offense if you have 10 or 11 personnel out there, even dime, which we've seen Tulane go into. If anything, that's really when we see them match personnel. But I'm fascinated by the fact that we've seen often not having that nickel and Caleb Bransaw be in the starting series depending on what's been going on on the offensive side. So I think that's really going to be a fun wrinkle of Tulane's defense to really break down. It also allows you to get a little more creative and out of the box in terms of what guys can play at what roles. And I will keep saying safety to me is, is a really solid group for these guys. You know what you have in Bailey Despaini. Jalen Geiger has shown you know, just real potential and his size continues to stand out. I think Jack Chinchu has been such a fun, scrappy gritty player to watch that demands your attention and who knows really what he'll be able to do in fall camp. Um, and, and for all we know, you could see some of these guys end up moving around to some corner roles, but I think we are going to see a lot of bit of moving parts because you also have Kevin Adams back there. You also have Joshua Moore backing up in that safety role. So, you know, just Chinchu have the quickness to be able to play a corner. I'm not entirely sure. It's something I would have to look into, but in terms of kind of projecting what this team is going to look like moving forward, I think you really have to wait and see how they bolster that secondary group with those losses of 
who I would say would be, you know, CB2 on both sides of things in DK Magruder and Jair Jean. And I, I think that, again, Rishi Rattan has played incredibly well and has deserved running with the ones. Lou Tillery has really come in clutch just as much so, but I, you're still just thinking about the experience at that position. Uh, and it really matters probably a lot more than others. So you see them making those offers in the transfer portal and we'll really see how those kind of things go. Um, but that's kind of really what my takeaway is from the defensive end, because you have the same system over the last couple of years, even when Shield Wood came in from coming over from Troy, it was already a very similar system, what they were running at Tulane. And now they're running essentially the exact same one under this coaching staff coming in. So the terminology, the language, that's all easy for these guys. And you have guys that have come over from Troy on the defensive side, not on the offensive side. You have Jack Chinchu, you have uh, Deshaun Batiste, you have Chris Rogers, and you have Caleb Bransaw. So those guys all come over from Troy. We've seen them play impact roles at that. Um, and then you have uh, most of the other guys are at least returners familiar with the language we haven't you know, seen in terms of the line and linebackers. Those have been guys that have been developed at Tulane and, and quite frankly, corner as well. So you know that the language is already there. You know that that side of the ball is going to be up to speed a little quicker than the offense, one that's also having a quarterback competition. So it, to a degree is a little impossible to evaluate what a secondary looks like when you just really can't see what it's going to look like at full speed necessarily. Um, but I think that we're going to honestly see some newcomers coming into fall camp. So I'm going to wait for this week to kind of play out with the transfer portal still being open until the 30th. Uh, that's how long it is until you can you know, declare to be in the portal. Uh, for all we know, we could see some guys come back too. I don't know. Um, once you enter the portal, a team's not required to honor your scholarship or bring you back, but we could see it happen. We saw it happen with Kai Horton, Alex Bauman um, in, in this past offseason entering the portal. So it, it's hard to say for sure, but it's also kind of hard to say what this team is going to be looking like until that all shapes out, because we all know that there are still some needs that they're definitely going after in the portal. But the fact that, again, that Spring game started with a three and out, three and out, fourth down stop, fourth down stop for, by this defense. It, it's just been a very strong unit. So we'll see how the depth plays out. We'll see how everything goes out. But we've seen guys play their way into positions on the field, and it has been based on promises or you know, just because you were starting at this position to start off camp. As I, I just continue to say, Rishi Raton, the way that he diagnoses plays, the way that he breaks to the football, he has the play speed and the IQ. The whole thing is a lot of the time you, uh, when you see these guys that can't translate what they can do in spring onto, you know, a game setting is either they're lack, they're very smart, but they're lacking the athletic traits. And so they just can't get there fast enough or they're athletic, but they just don't really know how to get there in time, know how to diagnose a play. And the perfect marriage of those two is really what you refer to as play speed, someone that can diagnose a play and then react really quickly. And that's really what you've seen out of Rishi Raton. And his interceptions haven't just been lame ducks thrown by the quarterback. He's he's very he's covered the routes really well. You can tell that he's seen an understanding of how those routes declare and develop at, down uh, field. And so seeing him start to take those reps with the ones, I, I think even though the departures of Jai Eugene and DK Magruder hurt in terms of depth, I, I think that Rishi Raton has been the better player out of them. And so you want to see him being that starter. And that should really more, matter more than anything else, because I do think that you're going to see some other guys come in at that role. But it, it's just such a story that I think everyone wants to root for. And it's not always about the story. And I don't think that's really what's going on here. But when a guy really just works hard, has been a walk-on, and plays his way onto the playing field with that opportunity, it just feels good in a different way. And the same thing with Fat Watts after – leaving the team, getting a really bad injury, and then coming back and kind of choosing to heal a lot of the, the I think that a lot of players come to heal themselves out of the, um, in football, whether that's coming from the transfer portal, whether that's coming back after injury. I just think that it is so much more of an emotional sport than people might always consider uh, time and time again, until you get to the eve of the draft, uh, where all of a sudden it's, all these emotional stories and these guys' lives changing overnight. Uh, I know that was kind of a hard segue, but it's really just as I'm watching the clock tick down here and thinking about the amount of guys from Tulane that are going to be entering this year's draft, 
and it is fun and cool and exciting to watch you know, who your favorite team is going to end up drafting. But I continue to say that it just feels heavier uh, as the years go on, uh, knowing that really these guys have put the entirety of their lives at this point into just these quick three days where you're based on 32 teams all kind of reacting and playing mind games with each other. Uh, and then your life kind of comes out of that. So to end this, as much as I want to talk about this team moving forward, I think that there is A, plenty of time to do that, but B, we have to just see where this team shakes out at that point. And then you look into the film of who these guys are that come in and what we can kind of surmise this team might look like. But you know the defensive identity, you know the system, we just don't necessarily know the moving parts at some of those skill positions in the secondary or at that edge rusher role. And you have your questions on offense as well. So once that all settles, that'll be fun for me to kind of get into here. But my favorite part about being the sideline reporter has just been covering these guys with a character that feels unmatched. And of course, I talked about confirmation bias in my previous episode. Um, I can't remember the exact name for you know this type of bias. It's not confirmation bias, but it's the, I have never been around other guys. I, I went to school at Tulane. And this is the only football team that I've covered like this in any type of capacity. But it just, guy to guy, the way that these guys are as men, as people, as leaders, as teammates, as human beings, it's it just, that's my favorite part about covering this all. And that's really, really what I want to end today's show on. As I said, to kind of open the show, I was at the Zurich Classic. I was on the sports hangover from about 12 to 2 with Gus Cattengale and Todd Graffanini, but with Gus and myself really just kind of going back and forth about the draft. And I'll be entirely upfront, I really don't know that much about any prospects going into this year's draft and who uh, the Saints might end up taking and where the guys at Tulane are projected to know go. Uh, I do not like draft coverage for a lot of reasons talked about the emotional component of it, but I also just, I'm almost too rational and logical uh, to be able to engage in this exercise because it's just really hard for me to predict anything, knowing that all it takes is one team to get an idea about a guy or uh, a run to start at a certain position. And then all of a sudden, everything behind that is changed where every pick is not independent of one another. That was someone that another team was looking at. That might've been someone that, a team that had the next pick was going to draft. Now they're on the clock and, and what are they going to do? And so do they kind of panic draft? Do they trade away? We don't always know what's kind of going on inside of all those rooms. And so it's just, for me, become more and more impossible unless I have the time to dedicate to a specific position group and really watch the tape on these guys to know anything at all. And as much as we can all predict about quarterbacks and who's going to be the, the next best one, where their best fit is going to be, um, no offense to NFL teams, but I think that a lot of NFL teams aren't good at evaluating quarterbacks. And so how can we, uh, when I think that there's just so many misses, and I don't really know why. I think you could point to a lot of different factors. There are teams that, you know, I was talking about this before. Do they draft based on need? I was talking about the Saints, you know, potentially drafting or trading back. I've always kind of been an aggressive-minded person myself, never really saw the value in doing that, but... Also, are you kind of a victim of thinking that you know when a guy is a surefire pick? Or are you better off kind of stacking your chips a little bit? I think a lot of teams would be better off in that latter category, but it's also hard to kind of go against who you are as a person. And I also think that that just all gets thrown out the window when it comes to quarterback. And it's going to be very fascinating this year for me to see how this all kind of shakes out and what the first round looks like, what the second round looks like. Because I, I think... It's really hard to have the same conversation about what teams might do in the first round in terms of trades when it comes to quarterback, because teams will lose their minds and go crazy and trade the moon for the quarterback that they think is their guy. I mean, it's true. And to a degree, as much as I just said, you might be able to, you know, do we have the ability to evaluate our own biases and know that that guy is the guy uh, when it's a quarterback, you just have to pull the trigger. You can't sit back, wait hope that he falls to you and you have to be able to at least think you know how to go get your guy. I just don't think enough teams swing every year at that uh, or really take it seriously at all. And I keep bringing up the 49ers and Brock Purdy. And it's not to say that guys taken in the seventh round as the last pick are always going to be Brock Purdy. 
it's more about how the 49ers approach their quarterback room, where I don't think half the teams in the NFL have the ability to put their egos aside and admit that the guy they spent three first round draft picks on or however many to take third overall isn't their guy. And the guy they took last in the draft is and have the kind of gall to just go with that. But it goes to show why you have to kind of keep drafting these guys. And we saw all these injuries take place in the NFL last year. Teams very quickly getting down to their QB3 undrafted rookies. And that's a panic button for these teams. And you have to really look around your room and say, are we good with QBs one through three? Because if not, then we should be looking to take one in this year's draft. So I could see this year just being more quarterback heavy. It also has a good quarterback class. And that's where we have one of Tulane's best to ever do it going into this draft in Michael Pratt. Uh, Again, I'm not a quarterback guru. I can't promise to project what his traits are. I can't promise to project what anyone's traits are. If you're a quarterback that gets drafted to a team that doesn't have an O-line and isn't scheming around you and throws you out there in week one with no experience, then it doesn't matter who you are at all. And that applies to Caleb Williams, for that matter. Someone that I've seen play was incredible to watch in person, but you are, there's no such thing as being superhuman. I used to use Aaron Donald as my example, but um, whoever, Nick Bosa, they're chasing you down in the NFL. It, it just doesn't matter how much you can improvise unless there's no O-line. So that's really what I look at more than anything else. So, you know, where does Michael Pratt go? Will he have a chance to develop? Will he have a chance to kind of be behind a guy that will help him grow in the quarterback room? But there are a lot of quarterbacks that need to develop as leaders. That's what we're talking about with the whole Tulane quarterback competition going on right now is that they're all kind of not there yet in terms of leadership. And that is the number one thing. If you ask me about Michael Pratt, is he is a true leader of men in a way that really transcending football isn't the right word to use because to me it has a positive connotation. And unfortunately, all of this is wrapped up in tragedy for Michael Pratt. Um, and I remember when... I was breaking down Sean Payton retiring, Willie Fritz retiring, and kind of thinking back to Sean Payton, but just how a lot of people in New Orleans, it feels like tragedy, trauma, and football are all wrapped up in the same thing. And to feel kind of that connection with your team and feel really healed through football. And it was a very unique experience for me growing up to really see what sports can do and bring you around and truly lift you up as a person. And That's really the story of Michael Pratt, where he was a kid that was homeschooled up until eighth grade. And at that point, has never played football in his life. So he goes to ninth grade. He starts playing football. He's never been in a school setting before at that matter. Ends up transferring either his junior or senior year to Deerfield High School, where there was a sitting starting quarterback, beats him out in that competition to then become the starter for that role. Um, which is where he met his friend Bryce. Um, I really encourage everyone to watch this segment. I want you know him to be able to tell the story in his own words, Believe in Seven. It's on YouTube now. Uh, Tom Pelissero with NFL Network really just did a really incredible job of allowing Michael Pratt to tell his story. Uh, you know, I don't love the NFL draft, as I said, for a lot of reasons. Another one of those being the way that stories like this kind of just get exploited and become fodder throughout the draft of let's just bring up whatever tragedy this person is going through. But with Michael Pratt, I think there's a huge difference here because he's really taken control of this. And it's the type of story that if it reaches one person, it truly makes a difference. And when you talk about him being a leader and how he's able to lift people up and why players like fight tooth and nail to the death for this guy, And where that leadership really comes from, the unfortunate reason has a lot to do with that trauma. But when you look at what he went through in terms of trials and tribulations to just even get to Tulane at that point, where his best friend committed suicide right before he ends up leaving for Tulane in January to come start off-season workouts. And this is the year of COVID, so everything is isolated. And that, that is just, it's a nightmare beyond words to even speak about. Um, and it's it's something that is very important to me as well as someone that worked in mental health. And I don't want to get into the story, but I've had to make a call before. Um, and it really shaped my life in a way. Um, it really took a lot from me in terms of how much that really got just that whole experience. But I really just feel 
that not not so much kinship, but I, I can understand just really the, the the true avenue of where that pain comes from from him. And then he comes to Tulane and goes through these off season workouts. The first thing he does is check on his coaches and teammates when he's back at his high school. You hear his high school coach talking about that. And then he comes to Tulane, has to get used to the academics of all these things, has to leave his family after all of this has just happened. And then he comes off the bench a couple of games into that season, becomes a starter, and then just never looks back uh, and never allowed any of that to come out. And if any, if anything, was in the best mood of anyone that I'd seen every day at practice. But you just got there and you could see how much guys just were drawn to him and how much they really wanted to fight for him down to the final nail. When you look back at the Cotton Bowl, there's a lot of teams that aren't able to pull off what they did at the end of that football game. Uh, most, if not all, to, to be honest with you, in terms of what they were up against. But I, I said this, and I don't want people to run with it, but in that moment, I truly felt how I felt about True Brees when I was watching Michael Pratt drive down the field for a second time in two minutes. Uh, just knowing that he would do legitimately whatever it took to lead his team down that field and leave every part of him, blood, sweat, and tears, literal blood. He was bleeding almost every single game profusely at that. Uh, and you really just learn where that comes from when you hear really what his story has been. And then going into this year, he ends up losing his brother uh, in a month before the season started. It's just the amount that that kid has gone through and then still continue to show up, be a leader, talk about mental health. Uh, it's one thing to get through these types of situations. It's another thing to then have the courage and, and strength to be able to get out there and talk about these things on this type of platform while, while all of these things are happening in the biggest moment of your life. And to me, again, when you ask me what makes Michael Pratt great, I'm not going to say the things that he's gone through because that's a horrible thing to say. But the, the reality is he has gone through great tragedy and trauma off the field, and he has come out on the other side of it as the man that he is. And that is the type of guy that players want to get around and fight for. Uh, for. He's And that's where you see guys in on-field adversity, where the, the hurricane evacuation was really, really demoralizing. And that season was really, really demoralizing. I don't think people realize just how incredible it was what Tulane was able to do after that 2-10 and 10 season, what the leadership of that room with Michael Pratt was able to do for a team that halfway through the year prior, the head coach said guys didn't know if they were on offense or defense while playing. I mean, it was really that bad. And if you ask me, really steady that ship. Yes, you can point to so many of the leaders on this team, but it just hits a different level with Michael Pratt. And you saw it at the Senior Bowl. You just see the way that he takes guys under his arm and lifts up guys around him. He elevates everyone, and everyone wants to be better and fight because of the guy that he is. And it was, we're talking about these quarterbacks in this draft class. You can talk about pedigree all you want, but it, it just sticks out to me, for example, when we're talking about Caleb Williams. None of really the red flags people talk about have that much to do with what his style of play is. And I don't really think they're fair ones at that, but people have been kind of critical about how he's handled the offseason draft process and you know, what, it, how he translates as a leader. And I think that that's been picked apart to death in a very weird way on social media, but it just goes to show really what teams are looking for, even when it's the consensus overall number one pick, that's the trait that they're looking for. Um, you know, they, it's, it's a joke in draft day about uh, did everyone show up to his birthday party? But as absurd of a movie it is, it's a good microcosm of what kind of question it says a lot about a quarterback and what really makes them great at the end of the day. I don't know how he's going to project in terms of scheme, in terms of fit. I think, you know, he can work on his accuracy a little bit. He's been working on his off season, his throwing motion a little bit this off season, but he has everything that it takes as a quarterback when you look at the well-rounded piece, when you look at the intangibles and the things that aren't going to pop off on a draft board. And when you see a team take him in, I, I honestly could expect it by the third round. Um, that That's really going to be what it's for. And, you know, I'd love to see him end up somewhere like, for example, Detroit, where I just think his fighter spirit would work so well with that city. But 
no matter where he ends up, I know that he's going to continue to fight because that's just the type of guy that he is. But it's just been truly such a pleasure to be able to cover someone who is as great of a leader and as, as the guys on the team are just drawn to him in the way that he is. And, and watching him fight in the games that I've seen him fight in, you know that everything that he's gone through, and it does just kind of – it makes you think differently about how hard he fights for those fourth downs, how he battled in that Oklahoma game after the hurricane and, and everything, how he just leaves his whole soul on the field every single game. It's unlike anything I quite frankly have seen in an athlete for that matter. And I've seen a lot of them at this point. Um, and so on the eve of this draft night, I do just think it, it's so important to talk about football and all of that, but it, it's equally, if not that much more important to have the conversations about everything else, but, and that mental health is important and that it matters. And, you know, he ends th this sentiment saying, you know, if you're suffering that there are good people on this earth that love you and will be here for you and just find that courage and reach out to the people around you that will, you know, those kind of things get through to guys, especially when it's someone, the most important position on the field where all the responsibility, all the leadership, you're looking at him. That's the type of guy that you're getting in Michael Pratt, the type of guy who checked on his teammates and his coaches and everything else before really getting to himself. And, that applies to these situations of great tragedy, but it also just applied to everyday scenarios on the field and where you'd see someone kind of, you know, any scuffles on the sideline of frustration. He was always the one calming it down. He was never the one doing anything other than bringing everyone back together, going over to the defense when, uh, you know, they made a good stop. When he was the when he was injured during games, really putting his arm around the quarterbacks that were out there, helping them through everything. It's just truly been a joy, and I'm going to leave it at that. We're going to see where all these guys end up at Tulane, and I want to do a uh, you know a special show after the draft is over. But that to me really it, it's more than football, and it's worth people watching, and it's worth seeing. And for whichever team that ends up with Michael Pratt on there. I just truly want you to know how much of a competitor, a fighter, and a leader of men he is, and that those traits are just pretty hard to come by uh, in football, especially with transfer portal and everything. The fact that he stayed, built this program, went through everything he did on and off the field, and came out where he is today, uh, it, it's just the definition of a success story and one that I can't wait to watch continue, as well as all of these guys, Jaquan Jackson, Lawrence Keyes, Lance Robinson, uh, sincere Hainsworth. I don't want to start you know, naming people because I'm going to forget them. AJ Hampton, Jerry Monroe, Cam Pettisco. There are so many guys. We'll see where they end up. And a lot of them, you know, they might go undrafted. They might end up on practice squads. All you need is that one opportunity. And if I know anything, it's that the quick character and the quality of these two lane men will take that run with it. So with that, y'all, I'll see you on Tuesday.